Hello students, thanks for watching. This is Professor Paul, and this is the first in a three-part uh, series called What is Literature? Just a basic uh, introductory set of lectures uh, reviewing some fundamental questions. So our purpose here, uh, again, as I said, is just to ask some basic questions, go back to some really um, foundational, fundamental ideas, but look for some new insights by going back over some ideas that we probably already are familiar with, or at least think we're familiar with. So, part one today is foundations. So let's just think about defining literature. The most basic definition of literature is really just anything that's written down, it includes any sort of text that includes language, signs, books, uh, letters, business papers, graffiti, comic strips, anything that uses words is counts in the general, most broad definition of literature. However, when we normally think about literature, we make a distinction, and that's between what we think of as literary works, that's what we really mean when we say literature, and so-called non-literary works. So, what counts as a literary work? Well, in a lot of ways, the old definition of I know it when I see it is what counts as a literary work. We normally think of the standard forms of literature, novels, short stories, poetry, drama, plays, that is. These are the standard forms of literature when we think about um, the term and what we look for when we go into, for example, a bookstore to buy something called literature. We look for these types of texts. So there's an association here with uh, artistic quality and with high culture in a lot of ways, things that are um, for the upper classes or for the intellectual, the elite, the intelligent. So what's excluded from literature often in our conventional definitions? Well, we think about the non-artistic text, that is things that aren't that don't have an artistic purpose. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Things like cookbooks, textbooks, nonfiction history uh, stories, things like that, newspapers, magazines, all these sorts of published material that don't have an artistic but have a more informative purpose. We also normally don't include personal writing, like someone's diaries or journals, uh, letters that people send to each other, or in our modern world, emails, blogs, tweets. These are generally not considered literature. Of course, there's always exceptions. Also though, sometimes when we think about literature, especially from an academic perspective, in the past there was a tendency to exclude low fiction. These are things that aren't novels or short stories and things like that, but are considered popular or lowbrow. Science fiction, fantasy novels, romance novels, like the kinds you see at grocery stores. These sorts of things were often not considered true literature or artistic literature, at least. And that also includes non-literary forms, things like comic books or graphic novels or graffiti, which uses words often, but is not considered literature or hasn't been generally in the past. So I want to examine the fundamental assumptions here that, that underlie this conventional definition that most people have when they think about literature. So in order to do that, let's ask some questions. The first question is, what is art and what does it do? What do we mean when we say something is artistic? What defines an artistic work in its qualities or its operations from something that's not art, that's not artistic, that's not art? And of course, who says, who defines what counts as art? Who gets to make this definition? So first, let's get a dictionary definition of the word art. The expression or application of creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form, such as painting, drawing, or sculpture. Note the specification here, although it says typically, but it excludes a lot of things that we would normally think of as counting as art. Producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. And that's um, one of the definitions, actually the eighth definition, um, in the Oxford English Dictionary under the word 
art. So I want you to think about that definition, expression or application of creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form, intended to be appreciated for its beauty and artistic quality and emotional power. Um, what does that, what questions do you have about that definition? What words do you think are unclear or too vague? What would you want to define? What maybe doesn't sound right to you? What might seem to exclude things that you would consider to be art? Take a minute to, to do that. Some questions that I have is what qualifies as creative? I mean, are we meaning something that's brand new or does this include things that might remix or sample from or uh, rework something that someone else has already done? Of course, in fact, there's no way to be completely new. All art is in some way responding to something that someone else has done, building on someone else's technique or idea. So what me makes something creative or skillful even? It's also interesting that this definition specifies visual art. Now it says typically visual, but of course we don't think about art as only visual. I mean, often again, when we use the word art in our everyday language, we mean a painting or something like that. But we also would think about something like a, a film or a book or a, a work of music also being art. So why is art only visual or is art primarily visual? Does that have something to do with the way we as humans uh, uh, interact with it? Does non-visual art try to imitate visual art then? Uh, does literature try to imitate paintings? Does it ever go the other way? Does visual art sometimes try to imitate non-visual art? Do Are there painters who try to paint uh, the way a musician performs music, for example. And what qualifies as beautiful or emotionally powerful, right? What uh, we know, of course, in our uh, relations with other people, different people, we find different, uh, everyone has different tastes as to what they find attractive in, in other humans, and of course, also in art. And what qual qualifies as beautiful to one person might not qualify as beautiful to another or emotionally powerful to another. And what does it mean to appreciate art? How do we appreciate art? Does that mean that we have to be deferential to it, to, to worship it in some sense? Um, do we have to like it? Uh, does that require that we say, oh yes, this is good, I like this, even if we maybe don't? Is that what appreciation means? Or is there some more complex understanding or ability uh, uh, function way we might appreciate art? Now, art does often attempt to, uh, excuse me, literature does often attempt to imitate visual art. Um, and of course, that's because it's using words often to try to recreate real experience, trying to recreate what someone sees or smells or hears. So, of course, it's going to imitate visual art by trying to describe visual components or the visual uh, aspect of experience. And of course, we should also uh, know, as I've, we've said, what counts as beautiful to one person might be different for another person, but also what counts as beautiful changes over time, and it can vary by culture. Um, different, different forms of art, different uh, uh, styles are considered beautiful in different areas and different periods. So these things change. So does that mean that something is art in one era, but not art in another place or time? And when it comes to beautiful, we know that art can often depict things that are very ugly or horrific or violent and yet remain beautiful in a sense, remain powerful. We can still enjoy, even if it troubles us to see something ugly or horrific. Some of the most important works of art deal with the ugly and horrific, um, yet they are still art and they are still beautiful in a, in a way. And when it comes to how we engage with art, at least it's my belief that what it means, well, that appreciation can take a lot of different forms. There are many works of art that I appreciate for their importance and their power, but I don't necessarily want to look at them all the time or, or read them uh, or listen to them. 
Um, and we can be critical and thoughtful about art, even art that we enjoy or love. That doesn't necessarily mean that appreciation is without criticism or without challenge. Uh, the point, I think, as we'll come to later, is that art makes us think. So we can appreciate it without just being purely deferential to it. So we should keep in mind that art and artistic values are informed by our history, by our culture, by our social values. Again, things change over time. What is considered important or beautiful in one period might be considered ridiculous in another. Think about fashion and how fashion from just a few years ago or a decade or two ago looks ludicrous today um, and how our fashions will look ludicrous years from now. So artistic values change, and that's something that we have to keep in mind, especially when reading art uh, or literature from a different period or different place. Our artistic values are also shaped by the cultural elite, um, and that's something to be aware of. Those whose values, who is it in a society whose values are represented the most in art? Whose belief system, um, whose uh, attitudes or perspectives are represented? Art in any culture is going to be to some extent limited who gets to speak and what ideas are going to be expressed. It's not necessarily the richest or the highest authorities either that are the ones that express their values in art. Uh, in many ways in our own culture, it's the middle class that has its values that dominates much of our at least popular art. So who whose values are shaping this art that and whose values are being represented? That's something to keep in mind. Now today there's a lot more diversity in what counts as art uh, or literature. There's much more acceptance of art in non-traditional and popular forms, things like comic books, graphic novels, graffiti even, um, lots of things like that, songs, remixing um, as, a, as an art form. These are things that are being considered art now that maybe wouldn't have been in a more traditional or conservative culture or period. There's also a lot more art by underrepresented or marginalized artists, something that we'll talk about in a little bit as well. Uh, but more people have access to express themselves through, through art. And this is, uh, to me, one of the important things about art is that it's expressing new perspectives and exploring new topics. So that takes us to the next question, or the next part of the first question, really. And that's what, what does art do? What do we use art for? What purpose does it have in our society? So first, art entertains us and amuses us. It's something that we use to have fun. Art that entertains us helps us to escape from reality, to forget about the daily stresses and struggles. Um, and it can fulfill our wishes in that sense. Let us experience things that we'd love to do, like be a spy or a, a superhero, but that we can't really do in real life. And this can be very important and this can be good because it can provide us with, uh, spur our imagination, provide us with ways to think about possibilities for our lives beyond our everyday experiences. But art as entertainment can also be a bad thing. It can also be used uh, as the famous phrase from ancient Rome, bread and circuses. Give the people a little bit of bread, a little bit of food, enough to keep them fed, and give them entertainment, usually the more violent the better, and they won't revolt. They won't ever question what the leaders are doing. So art as entertainment can serve to distract us, to pacify us. Um, so that's important. That's why I think it's important always to think about what are the um, values that are being expressed in a work of art. Because at the far extreme, you have propaganda or brainwashing. You have art that's used to promote um, a sort of dogmatic view of reality. And again, to suppress questioning, to suppress independent thought, to suppress anything that, that questions the powers that be. Um, and so we've got, uh, like, for example, Triumph of the Will, one of the most famous movies, uh, propaganda movies in history, a, a work promoting the uh, Nazi party. Um, considered a great film in many ways, technically, but also uh, a terrifying example of propaganda and how art can be used to promote hatred and violence. 
art also represents reality. So let's think about what we mean when we say art is a representation of reality. So first, to present something. So when we present something, that just means to offer, to show, or to give something. So reality presents itself to our senses, to our experience. We are present in our everyday reality. That's our experience of life. Now, when we say something represents, that means it stands in for something or someone else. So one thing replaces, stands in, takes the place of something else. So for example, common usage, one common usage, an elected official represents the voters. So one person stands in for many people, the ideas of many different people. One symbol represents the ideas of many. Another example, at a traffic light, red, the red light represents stop. The color and the light stands in for the order to stop or the direction to stop your car or else you'll get uh, in a car accident. And in fact, this is another great example because even just the shape of a stop sign, the octagonal shape and the color is enough to represent stop to us. So this is a very abstract representation. Just a color stands in for a complex idea. Stop your car or else you're going to hit another car or a person. And another example of representation, when I say the word I, I'm representing myself. I'm representing the proper noun Ryan. Instead of saying Ryan says, I say, I say. Uh, and this is an example again of one thing standing in for another. And here's a symbol, the symbol I, that like a representative, uh, an elected representative, a political representative, can stand in for many different other things. When I say I, it represents me, but when you say I, it represents you, if you follow me. So when we're talking about art as representation, the artistic work stands in for reality. It becomes reality for us. We experience the work as if it were reality. So you're watching Game of Thrones, we know in real life there are no such things as dragons, but you accept, oh my god, look, there's dragons. You accept it, you experience it as if it were reality. You're terrified when you see the dragon swoop down to attack, etc., etc. So we accept the work in that sense. We accept it as a representation, and we find ourselves present in it. Although, of course, not always. Sometimes we might not accept the work. We might find it unbelievable uh, for one reason or another and not be able to identify with it. But this is the goal when we think about art as representation. Another take on this idea of art as representation or literature as representation is representation, a repeat of the presentation. So the way reality presents itself to us, we are showing reality again. We're presenting it to the reader or to the audience, if we're the artist, presenting reality in a new form. That's what art does for us. That's what literature does. So it's a new presentation, a different presentation of reality, showing us something that we didn't see before, something that's not in our, that we're not aware of, at least, or that's not present in our everyday reality. And this is how one of the ways that art, as I've talked about, discovers new perspectives, communicates other experiences, and proposes new ways of thinking. You see the world, you are the world is presented to you again from the perspective of a different person who's led a different life, who's had uh, a whole different set of experiences and values. And so you are able to think about the world in a different way. A third view of art. Let's think about art as experimentation. So what does a scientist do? A scientist asks, what would happen if blank? What would happen if we mix these two chemicals together? What would happen if I cut the arm off this uh, uh, starfish? What would happen if we 
um, grafted an ear onto a mouse. All these random things. They, ha they ask what happens. And then the scientist isolates the elements and they that, that they're involved in their what-if question, and they observe the reaction. Now, this is, of course, a very, very simple take on the scientific method, but in its broad basics, that's what scientists do. They ask what would happen or what's going on. They isolate something and they observe it. In the same way, I like to think about art as a sort of experiment uh, with the imagination that is both the artist's imagination and the audience or reader's imagination as the laboratory in which the experiment is taken is taking place. Because what an artist does is they choose aspects of reality and they focus our understanding of the world through those aspects and then they observe what happens. So for example, a painter can't paint every single microscopic detail of a scene in front of them, so they pick certain aspects to emphasize, certain colors to highlight, certain shapes. And that's how we see that artwork. That's how we get an understanding of whatever it is they're trying to represent. They, they say, what would happen if we looked at the world through this particular perspective? And that's what literature does as well. And this can include the content of the story, the content of the work of art, like where it's set, what would happen if we set it in a different place, or what would happen if a spy had to find a, a, a certain nuclear element, whatever it might be. But it can also include form, right? The structure, the way the story is told can be part of the experiment. So, as an example, what if a man and his brother reunited after years apart? That's an that's a experiment. What would happen? Well, let's observe. Let's watch the man and his brother reunite and see what happens and see what we learn about human interactions. That's the what if part. That's the story part, the content part of the experiment. But there's also the form side, the structure side, the way it's told. What if we only saw the older brother's perspective? So this is different, for example, if we watched a movie where we could see both characters, but what if we only knew what one person thought? What if we only saw everything from the older brother's perspective in this reunion? So we have the experiment of what if this thing happens, and we also have the experiment of what if we look at it from this perspective? And this is, if you hadn't guessed, Sonny's Blues. That's one of the stories that we'll be reading this semester. Here's another example. What if a man were searching for his wife's killer? That's your what if experiment. Well, what if there's this guy and he's looking for his wife's killer? What would he do? What would happen when he encounters this challenge or that problem or when he finds this clue? That's the, that's the story side, the content side of the experiment. So we drop a man into this scene, into this situation like a rat in a maze and see what happens. And then there's the formal side of the experiment. What if we told this story in reverse order? What if we saw a scene and then we saw what happened five minutes before? And then we saw what happened five minutes before that? And then we saw what happened five minutes before that? How would that change our experience? What would we see differently about this man's search for his wife's killer if we started at the end where he'd found the killer and went back to the beginning of his search? That's another interesting experiment. And if you're curious, this is the film Memento, uh, one of Christopher Nolan's early films, if you haven't seen it. And here's one that's just a pure formal experiment. What if I wrote a whole story, a whole novel, without using the letter E? None of the words that I wrote could use the letter E. I'd have to choose all sorts of different words. I couldn't use the word the. I couldn't use the word letter. How many... How would I, what would I choose instead? What words would I use? And how would that change the kind of story that I could tell if I didn't use any words with the letter E? And there's a novel that does this. There's many novels that do experiments like this or poems that write only using one vowel or without a certain letter. So that's an experiment of its own. So there's really infinite possibilities for variation in content and form. I mean, there's an infinite number of stories. What if a man was searching for his wife's killer? What if a man was searching for his wife's killer in space? What if a man was searching for his wife's killer 
Under the Ocean. What if a man was searching for wife's, his wife's killer and traveling through time? What if a man was searching for his wife's killer, but we only saw the story in mime? You know, there's an infinite number of different ways that stories could be told, so an infinite number of experiments. And each one tells us something a little bit different. Now, because these experiments can be so fanciful and strange sometimes, it requires that we suspend our disbelief. This is the phrase that the famous poet and critic Samuel Taylor Coleridge used, suspension of disbelief. Now, what does that mean? If you haven't heard that phrase, what, what do you think that might mean? Basically, it's we accept the story as if it were real. Again, as, as we said before, I know that there aren't dragons in real life. So as I'm watching Game of Thrones, I don't say, well, it wouldn't happen that way because there are no dragons. I say, okay, I'm going to accept that there are dragons in this world. I consider another possibility, another perspective, an another reality. Another way to put this is that art asks us to uh, uh, consider this question. If this is true, then what else? If it's true that there are dragons in the world, well, what else is true? What else should I accept? How else is that going to change my understanding of reality by accepting this experimental perspective? And that's what artists do. That's what writers do. And that's what we as the audience and readers do. A fourth aspect of art, I think, that we can talk about, all these, of course, are overlapping, is expression, art as a form of expression. So people express their personal experiences, their emotions, their beliefs through art. Things that they've been through, things that are important to them, their memories and stories. But also, we express our social and cultural identity, our experience as part of a group in art, because no individual, no man is an island, as the saying goes. So any person who's expressing their experiences is also in some way expressing how they feel about their identity or expressing the experiences from the perspective of that social identity. For example, what it means to be an African-American man in American society, or what it means to be uh, a gay woman in society. Those are particular perspectives that an artist might express that go beyond just their individual life, but connect them to other people. And as we've talked about before, so this is what's the purpose of this. This is how art communicates with others, sharing understandings, sharing what's like being from this particular community, this particular group. What is it like to be that person, to live a life from that identity, with that identity? If you haven't lived it, you don't understand. So that's one of the things that art does, is it helps us to understand others. In addition to expressing one's conscious beliefs and values and experiences, we might say that art also expresses the unconscious, and that's the personal unconscious, but also the social unconscious. That the things that we're not aware of in ourselves, the, the assumptions, the core beliefs, hidden anxieties, desires, right? And this is why some people, you can sometimes psychoanalyze an author by reading their works and say, oh, well, this person, obviously he didn't like women. He had a real fear of being betrayed by women because all the female characters that he writes end up betraying their male partners. So you can maybe psychoanalyze that person a little bit, but that's not just that person's beliefs and anxieties. It's also the anxieties of the culture, right? In a culture where many people believe that, where that's a stereotype about women, then the author's not just expressing his or her own unconscious stereotypes, but the unconscious stereotypes of their whole society. Now, as I mentioned before, Historically, there have been really limited opportunities for literary and artistic expression. Um, you had to usually have education, you had to have money, you had to have free time, you had to have access to resources. Of course, this is not not entirely true. That doesn't mean that only people with all those things uh, were artists and writers, but um, limited opportunities for people who didn't necessarily have certain advantages.
But now, again, as I've mentioned before, there's a lot more interest in modern times and more openness to the unheard voices, people whose voices and perspectives haven't been expressed, people from the margins of society. And also there's been a lot of, uh, there's been an attempt to recover works, unknown works by these marginalized people that have been lost or suppressed. Because although, for example, there were limited opportunities for women to express themselves in literature uh, over the last few centuries, there were very prominent women poets and women writers. Some of them remained famous. Many of them, though, were sort of suppressed or their works were lost popularity. They weren't maintained in the way that male writers were. So there's also been an attempt to recover old works by these marginalized voices. So the importance of art as expression is that it shows, uh, is that it allows us to see more than just one person or one group's view of the world. Finally, thinking about sort of the most philosophical aspect of art, um, art is part of our search for truth, part of what we as humans do as humans, trying to find meaning in our life. So again, to compare it to science, science also looks for truth, but primarily truths of the physical world. Science tries to describe physical reality in all of its infinite complexity, and, and the physical world is infinitely complex, and this is why science is an ongoing process. Scientists are continually observing, reobserving, experimenting, revising, going back, checking their results, devising new experiments. Science isn't a set body of knowledge, but a continual process, an ongoing procedure, a search. And art does the same thing, I think. It's looking not though for the truths of the physical world that can be expressed in a sort of objective way, but the truths of human experience that can only be known through experience. So art tries to describe, to capture, to convey the reality of human experience in all its infinite complexity. Think of how many billion people are on the world, in the world right now. How many billions of people, trillions of people have died lived and died over the last centuries, millennia. All these different experiences, all unique, although, of course, with certain commonalities between them. And that's what art tries to do. Artists are trying to describe their portion of human experience. And literature in particular uses language and it uses words to evoke ideas, to provoke ideas, to make us experience these other perspectives and understand them in a personal, immediate way. And as science, as we know, science often contradicts what we think about as our common sense. For example, the motion of the earth in relation to the sun we know that the Earth revolves, uh, rotates on its own axis and then revolves in an elliptical orbit around the Sun. That's been proven through observation and scientific experiment. But how do we as humans perceive it? Well, common sense would tell us the Earth is still. It's not moving, it's standing still because I am standing still on it. And the Sun moves around the Earth. That's what we perceive, but common sense is wrong. So art also often contradicts common sense and experience. And this is why sometimes art can be very challenging for people in the same way that new scientific discoveries can be challenging. Evolution, the way the theory of evolution has challenged and upset many past ideologies. What people thought was common sense. So they react negatively. Similarly, art can contradict that, can contradict your common sense and experience. So if it's, for example, the story of a gay man or a gay woman, and you are not used to seeing those experiences, that can be troubling. That can seem like, well, that's not true. That's not reality. 
but that is reality. That's their experience. So art contradicts our common sense and experience often. And so we have to be always on the guard of, are we just rejecting something because it's too challenging, because it's too different and too new? So it challenges stale thinking and it shows us new truth, but also in doing so, it can upset us, it can shock us, it can disturb us. So let's review this first lecture. We raised some questions about what beauty means and who has the authority to determine what's beautiful and what's art or not. Questions about truth and the different kinds of truth that art might observe and about value. What is valuable about art and how we value art. We talked about the relationship of art to reality, thinking about art as representation, as standing in for reality, as showing us reality anew, showing us a new version of reality, as experimenting, as, as trying to imagine new possibilities. And finally, we talked about art and literature as part of the search for human truths, which to me, Personally, that's why I study literature, is because it helps me in my search to find a meaningful life. All right, that's the end of What is Literature Part 1. Go on to What is Literature Part 2, The Basics, and I will see you there.